Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Our next external speaker I want to introduce is Clay Shirky. He's an American writer, consultant, teacher on the social and economic effects of the internet technologies. His consulting practices focus on the way network technologies provide new ways for groups to get things done, including collaboration tools, social networks, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, collaborative filtering, and open source development. In his addition to his consulting work, Clay is an adjunct professor at NYU's graduate interactive <laughs> telecommunications program. He's written uh, extensively about the internet since 1996, and his new book, Here Comes Everybody, explores the effects of open networks. And Clay is going to be speaking to us as well as facilitating some of the afternoon sessions. Right. So with that, I turn it over to Clay. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a mixed, <clears throat> this is a little bit of a mixed session. I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about four things uh, for, the, uh, for this morning. First, I want to talk a little bit about this change in the way groups get, come together and get things done. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about places where we're specifically seeing that have an impact on innovation, on novel ways of using social, social tools uh, to drive innovation. Um, then I'm going to make some observations as an outsider about the uh, material that Kim shared with me, the results of the survey about innovation within Microsoft. And I want to end by talking about some patterns uh, that I think are, are characterizing the social landscape right now, some, some, some patterns around innovation characterizing the social landscape right now. So let me start uh, with the question of how groups are coming together and getting things done. Um, I, uh, I had a book come out this spring called uh, Here Comes Everybody, uh, and the thesis of the book in five words is group action just got easier. The, uh, the book examines the ways in which new social tools, principally the internet, tools built on top of them, and increasingly mobile phones, uh, are changing the way groups are coming together and getting things done. Uh, and I will take, uh, let, me, let me put up a concrete example right at the beginning to talk about some of the changes that I think these tools are occasioning. So this is a page uh, taken from Flickr, from the photo sharing service. Um, you can see here it's a pickup truck in front of a fairly dramatic sunset. This picture uh, uses a technique called high dynamic range photography. High dynamic range photography, or HDR, is a technique where you take three different exposures, and then you use software to combine them after the fact. So you get the brightest brights, the darkest darks, the greenest greens from the various different exposures into a single image. Uh, done right, uh, it's quite striking. It looks like a cross between a photograph and a pre-Raphaelite painting. Uh, done wrong, it looks like a box of crayons threw up. So there's, there's a real premium on technique. It's not enough to just have the software. You have to know what you're doing. So HDR photography starts showing up on Flickr, right? And then conversation threads attached to it. And this is that same page rendered as if you had a very long, skinny browser, right? This image here is that image up top. And even in half-point type, right, even in unreadable type, you can see what's happening here. The answers are getting longer. A conversation has started. So somebody jumps in and says, Oh, I like, this, I like this piece of software. How'd you do that? What do you do with these images? And it turns from an, an image to be shared into a kind of uh, casual conversation into a tutorial on high dynamic range photography. And at some point, people start inserting their own images, right? Here's another way I've done sunsets. How did you do this kind of technique? And a community of practice forms around the photograph, right? This is a group of people who've come together first because they like this object, and then they create this together without there being any managerial intent or any financial motivation. Right? And it isn't just that the radius of participation has increased, the half-life of the value has also increased. Right? I didn't participate in this conversation. I found it later searching for things on HDR photography. So this uh, combination of sort of fact and instruction manual continued to exist and continue to generate value long after the participants had left. Right? So you can see what's happened to group action here. The usual way that this kind of information, or, or in, the, in the previous media landscape, the way this kind of information would have been transferred is professionals would have adopted it. Then the media would have discussed it. It would eventually have gotten from 
uh, fashion pages and magazines into popular photography, and finally filtered into the nation's darkrooms. And that process would have taken about five years. In Flickr, on Flickr, it took three months for HDR to become something of a rarity to something that was, in fact, so ubiquitous people began complaining about it. Because the speed with which people who were interested in it could find one another and help each other get better at it as they went along. Operated at a, at a, it operated at a speed and a scale that wasn't previously accessible. Right. So this example reverses the usual order of user groups. Right. The, the, the user group philosophy is let's get everybody together who's interested in HDR. And then when they've got, we've got them together, right, then they can share what they know and, and, and learn things. Right. So from that pattern of gather, then share, Flickr and related services create a pattern of share, then gather. The group is actually called into being by the digital object. And people who didn't even know they were interested in HDR photography, by being attracted to this, suddenly come into contact with one another as well. This is, I think, uh, emblematic of the big change. Prior to now, communications media and broadcast media have been very separate. Right? When someone says, I love you on the TV, and someone says, I love you on the phone, we make a big distinction between the nature of those messages. We can tell which one is for us and which one is not for us by the mode of carriage. Right? That distinction is ending. Right? We have here an environment where there's a broadcast function. I'm, I'm displaying my photo to the world. And there's a communications function. And it's all linked together. So every URL is a latent community. In addition to the value that is on a particular web page or at a particular service, there's additional value in coordinating the people who come and look at it. Right? Now, most of that value is latent. Right? If we gathered everybody looking at the front page of MSN right now, they wouldn't have very much to say to each other. But when you can gather groups who are interested in very specific topics, like these kinds of photos, the additional coordinating and social value in putting those people in touch with one another is not only considerable for the participants, but can actually last well past the range of the encounter. Right. Here's another example, also of distributed uh, intelligence. This is a Tunisian prison map, as it says at the top. Right. Um, this is literally a map done by dissidents of all of the places in Tunisia where the government maintains a prison. Right. Something that has been tacit knowledge among this population. But no one person outside the government knew it. Right? And this framework is, is a, an embodiment of this idea that every URL is a latent community. By putting this map up, right, this allows for both the coordination and exposure of all of the various locations of these prisons, previously unknown except to the government. Uh, and even, I love the sort of Web 2.0 look of this, even reviews. Right, you can see this little box. I mean, you can imagine, right? This, right? It's, it's like they can't help themselves but look a little zagats, even when they're trying to do something this serious. But this is surfacing information which exists in the group and only exists in the group. Uh, John Seely Brown and Paul Duguid famously asked in *Social Life of Information*. What if HP knew what HP knows? Which is to say, what if the institution actually had access to the collective intelligence of its employees? This is a way of answering that question. The dissident community as a whole knows where the prisons are in Tunisia, but no one person knows it. And that knowledge has previously not only not been aggregated, it's not been shareable. Right? And this is a way of doing both. Another example. Howard Forums. Howard Forums is uh, a little site run by a guy named Howard Chewy up in Canada. He uh, is a uh, self-confessed cell phone geek. He was running a little blog on cell phones. People were coming in and bugging him all the time with their questions. So rather sensibly, he said, I can't answer all your questions because I don't, I don't have all these kinds of phones. I don't work with all these kinds of carriers. A lot of these people are in the US. So he just said, you all talk to each other. And he put up Howard Forums. Um, it, is, it is a geek emporium. Right? The front page of Howard Forums is broken down by manufacturer and then below this by carrier. And then when you go into these environments, right, you'll see specific pages. Right? So here is a specific page in the Samsung environment, how to generate custom ringtones. Mm -hmm. I, I, I 
forgot to mention this. This is, despite this being a geek important, this is not page views. This, this, is, this is actually number of posts in the topic. Right? This site, run by two people, is on track to do nearly a billion page views in 2008. And here is why. Right? So this, as I said, is the Samsung. This is how to do your MP3 files. Right? And again, rendering it as if you had a long, skinny browser. It is an incredibly detailed, step-by-step -step description of how to build ringtones into your phone using the map. Posted by one user for the other users. Right? I want to echo what Gary said this morning about low cost to the customer. Right? Novel services don't generate perceived opportunity costs. The other thing that low cost does is it brings into play non-financial motivations. Right? This person did this because they wanted positive feedback from the community, because it was very low cost to get that kind of feedback. Right? Howard Forums has become so good at doing this kind of thing that engineers inside both the handset manufacturers and the carriers will sometimes refer customers with hard problems to Howard Forums. Right? Why? What does Howard Forums have access to that the labs at Nokia or Verizon don't have access to? And what they have access to is reality. Right? The customer is the only person who has access to reality. Right? I'm using this particular phone on this particular network in this particular configuration. There is absolutely no way to model that inside any one company. And of course, the complexity cost, no one wants to answer for adverse interaction with, with items we don't own or sell or control. But those are the problems the users have. And what Howard Forums represents is a way to get observation of reality and low cost user to user participation in a way that can't be harnessed by, or can't be replicated by businesses, but can be harnessed by essentially agreeing to hybridize. And one, last, uh, one last observation about the general landscape of, of, of this stuff. This, this page, you will recognize an echo of 1996 in this page with its uh, very style and orange on black background and its very spare image-free design. This is uh, a screenshot from Bronze Beta, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, fan site. And Bronze Beta is just a simple, you know, conversational site. It's, it would, would, would be, I think, of, of not much interest because it's just like any web bulletin board out there, but for two facts. The first is that this was put up, the original site, Bronze, the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan site, was put up by Warner Brothers when they did Buffy and they were experimenting with web community and so forth. When they sold Buffy to UPN, UPN said, oh, that's great. We like Buffy, but we're not in the web business. So we're going to shut this community site down. And they went around saying, OK, closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And everybody who was on the Buffy site on Braun said, you can't shut us down. right? We love the show. We love each other. We love this place. You can't take this away from us. And UPN said, look, business is business. Sorry. The users got together. They raised their own money. They commissioned new software in the manner of a hermit crab requisitioning a new shell. And when they went to the programmers, they said, for God's sake, whatever you do, don't give it any features. Right? We don't want threading. We don't want rating. We don't want ranking. We don't want automatic filtering. We don't want any of that stuff. We want reverse chronological CGI-based dump of text. And in fact, if you go to the site today, this is what you will see. That's it. That's the site. There's no, there's no navigation because there's no pages. <laughs> it's just a text dump. If you went in and filled out that form right now, your comment would appear here. Right? This is still going. These people so love each other and the context that Buffy created that long after the show went into syndication, right, they've stayed together. Now it's mostly birthday greetings and so forth. Right? But this is, I think, one of the really important shifts in the software landscape. Right? This is the only example I know of where later stage products, more advanced products, have fewer features than earlier stage products. 
If you had gone back in time to 1998 and you'd looked at content management systems like Vignette and Interwoven, and then you dropped by Pyra to look at Blogger, and someone had said to you, 10 years from now, the enormous bulk of what is published on the web is going to be published off of that thing, that little pearl hack, rather than this set of professional content management systems, no, you would not have believed it, and yet that is exactly what came to pass. Here's why I think that is. We regard the computer as a box, right? The motivation is, I want as many toys as possible in my box, right? And then the feature list becomes desirable, right? It's the classic sale to the CIO. Well, this product has 17 features, whereas this other product has 34 features. Right? Plainly go with the 34 features because you've got more toys. Right? But the salient characteristic of the personal part of the personal computer is that I don't care how you use Word. I don't care which menus you turn on and off. Right? I don't care if you've got your own custom macros in Excel because I use mine a different way than you use yours and it doesn't matter. Things like this assume the computer is not a box but a door. The principal value of this site is not to get to it, but to get through it, effectively to get emotionally to the people on the other side of your screen. Right? And once you do that, you have a social coordination problem. Right? And the software that is succeeding, particularly now, as with, as with weblogs, as with Twitter, as with wikis, tends to launch with very few features, but a high degree of social synchronization. Right? Because the minds of the users synchronize around the use pattern, because it matters a lot to me when you're Twittering that you're having roughly the same set of expectations of the experience as I'm having when I'm Twittering. Right? And so having fewer features that create a kind of gestaltic experience and then building up from there turns out to be the pattern that in the social environment, now I don't, I don't, I'm not proposing this for all software, but for social software, right, the synchronization of the, of the shared mind of the user base uh, is turning out to be a really good predictor of success, and the long feature lists are not. One last observation about the general landscape before I move to innovation. This process is still very much, you know, we, we are in the middle of it. We don't yet know how this all plays out. There is a lot of work on sharing. There is a lot, uh, as with the Flickr example, there's a lot of work on collaboration. But the pattern that's still off in the distance is collective action. There are some tantalizing examples of it, um, but that's the thing that's just getting going. I want to tell you a, a, a story about collective action to illustrate the, the change. Collective action is when a, a whole group gets together and they go after a goal that succeeds or fails for the entire group, not for any individuals in it. The whole group benefits or not. And here's an example of that in action. Last, uh, last spring, HSBC, the bank went around the UK recruiting students and recent graduates uh, by saying, we'll give you penalty-free checking, right? Anybody who can remember college years understands why this is a good deal, right? You can run up an overdraft, you gotta pay the money back, but you're not gonna owe us anything extra. And of course, this is an attractive deal. They sign up new, uh, they sign up new customers by the thousands. Then, over the summer, all the students are dispersed, backpacking around Europe, doing their summer jobs, or whatever, spread to the four corners of the earth, HSBC says, oh, you know, we changed our minds, right? Uh, instead of uh, penalty-free checking, how would it be if, if you have an overdraft, we're going to charge you 140 pounds, which is like, you know, 500 bucks American. And it's terrible, of course, but by that time, the students are too far gone, right? HSBC does this in the summer because they've got two advantages over the students. One is an information advantage, right? It's hard to figure out how to get your money out of one bank and into another bank. There's just a lot of steps to go through. So even if people are angry, they're not going to be angry and motivated to do anything about it because the thresholds are too high. And two, right, HSBC enjoys a, 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 a coordination advantage, right? They are an institution. They've got management directive. The management says we're doing this. Everybody snaps into line. The students, right, a disorganized mess in the best of times, are now spread all over. What HSBC did not count on was Facebook. And so over the summer, a guy named Wes Streeting puts up a, a Facebook page called Stop the Great HSBC Graduate Ripoff. And they get thousands of people who join. Right? First thing that happens is people start documenting 
look, if you want to get your money out of HSBC and into Royal Bank of Scotland or whatever, here are the steps to do it, right? Buy by information advantage. Once one person has solved the problem once and documented it, the landscape shifts for everyone who owns a computer, right? As with the Flickr pattern, as with the Howard Forums pattern. Then they started having online protests, and the press picked them up, and then that got some more attention, and that got the pro protest to be bigger, which got more press. Not a feedback loop HSBC is very happy about. Then they say, as August rolls around, hey, we can just go down to the city. We can go down to London's financial district and have a real-world protest in front of HSBC. So they start making these very public plans for doing that. That protest never happened because HSBC caved. Right? And they sent, right, they sent somebody out to say, oh, whoa, 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 okay, okay, you know, we're a customer service agency. Obviously, we don't want to do anything that makes our users unhappy. So we'll roll back and we'll give you penalty free checking. Right? If, as an aside, if you want to know why PR people are paid the big bucks, it's being able to say stuff like that with a straight face. Right? Because HSBC didn't cash because the students were unhappy. Obviously, if you renege on a deal and suddenly charge someone a significant amount of money, they're going to be unhappy. HSBC caved because the students were unhappy and coordinated. Right? And that's, that's the big shift here. So group action has just gotten easier. It's easy to share. It's easier to collaborate. It's easier to take collective action. And those patterns, are, we're still working out ways just through trial and error, that those patterns can be engaged. So I'm going to switch to the second, second part of the talk. Oops. Instead of switching to the second part of the talk, I switched to the alternate applications. Sorry about that. Right. So I was um, listening to Gary talk. I sort of had the underwear gnomes business model uh, in the back of my mind. Everybody gets that this is possible, and the interesting questions are, of course, in the question mark domain. Uh, now, one of the problems with the word innovation that, and, and, and Gary took on in one way, and I'm going to take on in a slightly different way, is the word innovation has been hopelessly debauched. Right? If you read the business press, this is basically what it is. Right? It's a sauce. You can get it in the small size from HBR. If you want the big size, you've got to go with McKinsey. And you pour it on the org chart, and it makes the business more innovative or whatever. I have, I have found, when I was just looking around to see how the word's being used, I found Ford Motor Company talking about their innovative new colors. And I thought, either no, right, this is not an innovative new color. It will take Toyota no longer to copy this than it takes to mix up a gallon of paint. Or if someone has discovered a new color, this is a much bigger deal than the automotive industry is letting on. But that's, that's what's happened to the word. Uh, so I'm going to offer my definition of it. It is, I think, complementary to Gary's, but not, it, it, it's not exactly the same because it's coming from outside a corporate perspective. An innovation is a practical surprise. Right? That's my working definition. It's got to fit both sides of that equation. And in a business context, an innovation is a practical surprise that gives you some relief from commodification right? so that you're competing on something other than just pure price and revenue, pure price and revenue calculation. Um, once you have a practical surprise, there are several ways to do this. You can use secrecy. You can use experience. You can use IP law. The mechanisms for defending that market edge are several. But the, the key is to, get a practical, uh, is to get a practical surprise going. Um, taking that as the metric, you can also start to use the word innovation not as a binary bit. Is is not innovative. You can start to make uh, gradients to take what is, what is in our industry the most famous example, uh, one could say Xerox PARC was more inventive and Apple Computer was more innovative around the collection of, of novelty that launched with the Macintosh. Right? Because the, practic the, 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 the practicality actually rolled up to Apple to launch the GUI um, and to bring Windows icons menu pull down kind of menu. One of the things that's happening in the world of practical surprises is that the costs of operating at scales that were even, that, that were unimaginable even five years ago is now, those, those costs are falling through the floor. And we're seeing an enormous amount of experimentation uh, at scale. So let me, let me stop for a moment and put a big asterisk over 
uh, what I'm about to say next. My unit of analysis is the group, right? I, I look for places where the, there is a group of people working on something. I do not mean uh, to suggest that what I'm going to say next is about all innovation. There are innovations where a single mathematician working alone comes up with an algorithmic solution for something that is indeed groundbreaking. Uh, so, I, I, without without any regard for that, what I'm going to talk about is the social dimension. There are so there are other aspects of other other aspects and axes of innovation. But I want to focus on the on the change in the scale at which groups can operate. So, go through a couple of examples. Innocentive uh, is Alf Bingham's company. The idea behind Innocentive uh, is to take. Uh, Eric Raymond's uh, famous observation in, uh, in Cathedral in the Bazaar, many eyes make bugs shallow, and to turn it into not a bug fixing model, but a, a, an idea sourcing model. Right? The idea behind the incentive market is that if you can characterize a problem with, with a reasonable degree of granularity and attach a cash prize to it, you will call into the universe of people thinking about the problem on your behalf people that you could not hire on the open market for a variety of reasons. Either they're independent researchers or they're academics or they live outside your country or what have you. And so the idea here is to essentially, uh, with this combination of good characterization of the problem and cash prizes, change the scale at which you're sourcing ideas. One of the surprising changes that I don't believe Innocentive was planning on, but seems core to what is going on there, is that many of these challenges, so this is, this is a sample challenge overview. Seeker is looking for new preservatives for consumer products that are safe for both human health and the environment. Right? There's a cash prize of, I think this one, uh, $25,000 was, was, was connected to this one. Um, and it is, I believe, pure intellectual, yeah, there it is, $20,000. And the deadline, in fact, if you've got any good ideas about this, the deadline is still coming up, October 29th. And this challenge, I believe, I, I think I haven't got it up here, but this challenge is pure IP, which is to say it is not necessary to synthesize this. It is enough to merely characterize either the process or the output by which this would succeed. Right. And what this has done is it has put for-profit and non-profit institutions on an equal footing for the first time. Because in the hiring market, the choice between going for a for-profit and a not-for-profit entity is quite momentous for obvious reasons. But here, $20,000 is $20,000 is $20,000. So suddenly, the talent pool of people who are working in non-profit institutions available to for-profit companies and vice versa are being combined. So it didn't just create a market. It actually fused what were two relatively separate markets for this idea of, of sourcing innovation. Right? And you can see here there are several of these safe and environmentally friendly preservatives, inclement weather oil detection. These are all put up by nonprofit companies, but they're operating, they're operating in the same environment. And in 2007, when Innocentive put up their list of the 11 most successful innovators, none of them had more than a couple of solutions. This is, in fact, not about sourcing hyper-productive individuals who happen to live in a different country. This has actually changed the scale at which ideas can be sourced. And so it changes the probability structure of looking for ideas. Right? Every one of the things that shows up on Innocentive is almost by definition a problem that a group of people, whether for profit or not profit, a problem that, a, that an institution says, it's unlikely that we have the person inside our four walls who will be able to solve this. Right? Another way of saying that is, given our headcount, it is a low probability event that we will be able to source this solution. Right? But one way to change low probability events is just to have many multiples of them. Low probability times a lot of tries equals high probability. It's, it's back to Gary's poker analogy. And so incentive actually changes the environment at which uh, you, can, you can source these ideas. And that change, instead of trying to affect the likelihood affecting the cost structure, is, I think, fairly fundamental to what's happening in the innovation landscape. 
Another example of the same pattern. This is, uh, this is an example, I think, made famous by Jeff Howe, who both coined the term and has now written the book on crowdsourcing. This is iStock Photo. The observation in iStock Photo is that professional employment is a lousy proxy for certain classes of goods. Professional photographers take some percentage of bad photos, and amateur photographers take some percentage of good photos. And if what you want is not a photographer, but a photo, you don't really care who you get it from. And so iStock Photo said, we've got this enormously expanded universe of photos because of digital photography. There's an enormous contraction of signal, right? The signal to noise ratio of amateur to, to professional photographers is quite adverse. But if we had a way to filter the good stuff, right, we can sell it for a dollar, which is, as, as Howe pointed out in his Wired Magazine article of, I think, 2006, he has a 99% discount on what the stock photography industry was able to do previously. This is, this is an absolute, in that, in that domain, in that environment, this is an absolute game-changing observation. That the amateurization and the reconfiguration of the idea of filtering for quality changes the way people think about photography. It is such a game changer, in fact, oops, no, I can, I'll do this in two pieces, uh, two are tied together. It is such a game changer that this site, Photo Pres, right, amateur ph photographs of presidential candidates, presidential campaigns, and so forth, um, was done by the Associated Press who realized paying a photographer to go take a picture of John McCain is a bad use of our money and that photographer's time. Because when John McCain appears in public, lots and lots of people take pictures of him. Right? So all we need is one of those pictures. We don't have to send the pros to do that kind of job. Right? But the AP is set up as a traditional organization. How do they do this? They run into the filtering program. They, in turn, turn to Mechanical Turk. And they go on to Mechanical Turk, and they put up a job that says, we got a bunch of photos. Find a good one of Lynn Cheney. We'll give you a nickel. Right? And uh, the qualifications hit approval rate not less than 75%, which means if you get it right three out of four times, we'll give you a nickel four out of four times. Right? And what's happening here is that once you reach into that changed economics of massive scale, massive filtering problem, the new problems also require those kinds of solutions, right? The AP saw iStock Photo and said, oh, that's where the world is going. We're going to launch PhotoPres. And then they said, oh, we can't even solve the problems in the PhotoPres universe without also reaching into this large scale environment, right? And, and that forward feedback loop means that a lot of service design and a lot of uh, managing problems down to the threshold of tractability that Gary was talking about this morning are following this same logic and are creating a kind of positive feedback loop among these various solutions. Another example, this one now not working on scale as a pool, but rather scale as uh, a social environment. This is an example from IBM. Uh, it's a project called Dog Ear. Uh, dog ear is basically delicious plus a one-way mirror. Uh, it allows you to see public URLs and to see the tags of those URLs, but also within IBM to tag your own URLs and have only other IBM employees see it. And what dog ear did, because within IBM they saw the whole network of dog ear users, was allowed them to create not just sociograms, see who's sharing things, but it also let them see who was producing novel material and who was consuming novel material, right? Instead of assuming that all users were equal in the system, it said some people are providers, some people are seekers, right? And we're able to draw these connections. A few months after Dog Ear launched, there was a research group, one in, one in Armonk and one in, one in uh, Cambridge, England, who discovered each other through their Dog Ear accounts. They noticed that they were tagging the same URLs and they were giving them the same labels and so forth. And then, unprecedented in the history of research groups, they called each other. Right? Hey, what are you guys doing over there? Oh, well, we're working on this queuing problem. Oh, yeah, well, we're working on that queuing problem, too, but we ran into this dilemma. The Cambridge group, the Cambridge England group, says, oh, yeah, we think we've got a workaround for that. And then, really unprecedented in the history of research groups, 
they agreed to pool their resources. They decided to work on the problem together. Now, the only person in the whole IBM hierarchy, these are, these are research groups in different countries, right? The only person in the entire IBM hierarchy to whom both groups answer, Irving Ladowski Berger, right? He doesn't know what they're doing, right? Research, and in fact, all, all innovation is a famously upside down problem where the people who work for you know more about the problem space than you do, and you know more about the problem space than your boss. There is no way in managerial culture for anybody to say, oh yeah, you two groups ought to communicate. Just the overhead, the observational overhead is too high. What this system did right, is it let those groups discover one another laterally and out of their own self-interest. Right? I'll, I'll telegraph two points about patterns I want to talk about later, things that I think are uh, not about so much technology or practice as head shifts. I want to echo this thing Gary said this morning about a lot of this is, is, is about a question of attitude. Right? If you take the model of a silo, right, a hard edged storehouse of value, the question is silos, good or bad? And the answer is that's the wrong question. Right? You can't not have silos. You can't have everybody be in everybody else's business all the time because nothing gets done, right? You have to have some group that is working at fairly high intensity on a particular problem. And so instead of making it a binary, we're closed, we're open, we're closed, we're open, right? The question is about membranes and flows, right? The question is how hard or soft, how permeable or impermeable do these membranes need to be? And is the action of the flow get or send? Right? So one of the things I think is really important about dog ear right, is that it didn't say everyone's research should be everyone's business all the time everywhere in IBM. Catastrophe, catastrophe. Right? That works in a company of 12 people where everybody just kind of knows what's going on from you know, sniffing business pheromones doesn't work. Big companies can't innovate like little companies because they're big. Right? Big is different than small. Right? But big is advantageously different than small in this kind of circumstance. And this is the second thing I want to say. I'll talk about a little bit more about this, uh, talk a little bit more about this afterwards, uh, after we go through the, the, the Microsoft research stuff. But an underappreciated ramification of a lot of these collaborative efforts is that large scale techniques privilege big companies. The kind of things like diversity of outlook, diversity of experience, diversity of mindset, different groups attacking the same problem from different sides, those aren't things small companies can do. Right? And we've been through 10 years of Little internet, like the bestest place in the world to work is the little internet startup, right? You just want to be six people in a room. You want to be 12 people in a room. Uh, there are some kinds of things where it's good to be 80,000 people in several rooms, right? And dog ear is one of those examples where sourcing uh, and communication at large scale just creates different kind of effects that are by definition uncopyable by smaller competitors that I think needs a lot more attention uh, than it's currently getting. One last example from that. Uh, my, um, I, I, am, I am a paid up member of the chattering classes and uh, one of the things that my tribe has done wrong, and I include myself in this, and I'm trying to propitiate this by, by changing my language. One of the things my tribe has done wrong in talking about this stuff is use words like bottom-up, self-organized, hive mind. Uh, I've actually never used the phrase hive mind, and it was the phrase hive mind that really sort of sent me over the edge. Anybody who uses the word hive mind doesn't understand what's happening. Here's why. Right. This is the Wikipedia article on Pluto. It's an article I've been tracking for some years because it's an interesting proxy for me for how Wikipedia works. You may remember when Pluto got kicked out of the Planet Club a couple years ago, right? This precipitated an enormous conversation about how to characterize that change. Both the historical deliberations about kicking it out and also then how to describe Pluto as a result. Here's what the Pluto article looks like. Again, range, oh. No, I don't have the long, long version. But the Pluto article is tremendously 
detailed. It goes through uh, the planet itself. It goes through the history of its discovery. It goes through Greek mythology, all of the rest of it. Right? Because of getting kicked out of the Planet Club, it received over 5,000 edits, over 2,200 users, which, su which suggests, right, in the sort of hive mind model, that Pluto just accreted the way termite nests accrete, right? Everybody did two or three edits and the whole thing came together. That's not what happened at all, right? Although the average is 2.49 edits per user, or at least it was at the time I took the screenshot, there is no average user, right? This is a chart of participants, of, of, of participants in the Pluto article, editors for the Pluto article, ranked by the number of edits they provided. So serendipitous, the dean of Pluto, 335 edits on their own, right? Meanwhile, and you can see here, it's dropping off in the manner of a parallel distribution, about an order of magnitude, every order of magnitude up. Right? Meanwhile, more than half of the users contributed only one edit once ever. Right? If this were managerial culture, right, you'd, say the you'd take the classic 80-20 distribution and say, OK, well, these are good employees, and these are bad employees. We're going to fire these people. Right? But that photo and the paragraph on the, the ultimate decision about kicking Pluto out of, the, out of the list of planets were both contributed by these people. Right? Instead of saying, we're going to do an 80-20 optimization, what this form of large-scale collaboration does is allows for a huge imbalance of participation. Right? One way to look at this, right, you often hear Wikipedia discussed as a community, to a first approximation, it is not which is to say the bulk even of the people who participate do not engage in anything that we would recognize as communal. What Wikipedia really is is a very small group of people who care much more than average that this project succeed and are working to integrate the contributions of this much, much larger group. So instead of looking at it as an 80-20 optimization, it's looking at it as why give up 20% of the value? How do we design the service model? so that everybody who participates can participate at whatever level they're adding value. This is less concerned with efficiency than effectiveness, and it relies on massive over-provisioning of low-quality, cheap resources to add up to something useful, rather than having a high degree of grooming around the product. Right? And if you do a social map, right, if, you look at these, if you look at all of the editors of Wikipedia, I'm sorry, the Pluto article, all the Wikipedia edit of the Pluto article. The red lines are users who have co-edited 20 or more articles together. Right? And you can see here, in fact, there's even a centroid uh, element. And so a social structure, without being planned, a social structure has grown up in this environment right? that allows these articles to be created with a high degree of division of labor, but a low degree of managerial over. And that, that is the kind of thing that can only be designed uh, with these tools. I keep doing that. I don't know why. So with that, I want to turn to the internal survey. And I will offer only my observations as an outsider. I don't work for Microsoft, and I don't know very much about it except, except through Lilly. Um, so I can't speak to what corporate goals are or should be, but I'll give you some of my feedback reacting to uh, the results of this survey. I sent out a survey about a month ago oh, I'm sorry, I um, about to the, the, the audience in this group. We had about a 33% participation rate. And the survey was basically asking three general um, categories of questions. First of all, what are your biggest innovation challenges? What do you think are important? And what do you think you have success with? And we've aggregated these results and handed them over to Clay so he can present them to you. Thanks. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I, I was, was missing the missing back. Uh, so starting with what's important, right? These were the items uh, that were ranked important, very important. Um, the top four I particularly want to call your attention to, uh, recruit, hire high caliber talent, incorporate business strategy and market understanding into ideas and concept development, engage with senior thought leaders to share your work, and 
take ideas from concept to prototype. Pretty much 100%. That, that, I mean, when you're asking people about innovation, um, that makes sense. So that is, uh, there are several other things there, but those are the ones that, that stand out as the top four. Right? Uh, things, uh, things that the group, there was a high ranking of successful or very successful. Um, very successful at recruiting talent. Very successful at having ideas. Significantly, right? if having ideas is both important and there's a high degree of success at it, that suggests that the structure of innovation does not need to be on generating ideas but on doing things with them. That it's more about the practical than the surprising on the list of practical surprises. That same uh, observation with a little caveat is true of talent, which is to say hiring good people uh, is something that, peop that, that, that people feel they're successful at. Uh, there you go, did we? Oh yes, these were easy or very easy. Uh, these were things that, that uh, parts of the innovation process that people felt were easy or very easy. I want to call your attention uh, first to the bottom and then we'll work up to the top. Again, coming up with new ideas. Important, easy, successful. I think we're, we can regard idea generation uh, as an intake problem that could potentially be optimized, right? It's always, there's always ways to have more ideas, but not actually the core issue in thinking about innovation here. Uh, and the other is, people felt that they were successful at creating a repository of ideas and reviewing them periodically, which is to say, a kind of pool of received wisdom, uh, an equivalent of a sort of lightweight in-house literature. What strikes me as more significant on this list, though, were the things that were below the 50th percentile on I can do this well. Um, concept to prototype, align mission with corporate strategies, and engage with thought leaders to share your work. We'll see that pattern over and over again. So those are essentially the three positives. This is the stuff that's important. This is the stuff we're successful at. This is the stuff that's easy. Now switching to the negatives. Right? Going in the reverse order, starting with challenges. Uh, this is stuff that's difficult or very difficult. By the way, I want to stop station identification. I disown that typo. Um, it's supposed to be were. Uh, what's very difficult? Transfer incubation into a product group. Find appropriate incubation team for an idea. Discover and understand the work of, under, uh, of other incubation teams. Those stand out above what's effectively the default rate of, of, of response. Those are the three. Um, Work of other incubation teams, teams outside your group, transfer your incubation to a product group. Notice that they're all things that cross a social or business membrane. Right? They are all things about crossing the boundary from inside your group to outside your group. Success factors, unsuccessful or very unsuccessful. These are the, looking at the top five, transfer incubation to a product group. Incorporate ideas into multi-version product planning. Find appropriate incubation team outside your charter. Uh, and then at the bottom, attract other incubation teams and team members to work on incubation within your charter. Four out of those five, again, about crossing social or business borders. Right? This one is unusual in that create a repository of ideas and review them periodically also appears on this list. What that suggests to me as an outsider is that there is an imbalance in practice and it would be useful just as, a, as an exercise to get some idea of how people are doing this because some groups say they're doing it well, some groups say they're having trouble with it and it would just be good to try and arrange a lateral transfer of whatever, whatever best practice is within Microsoft. Yes, Chris. This is, no, this is percent of people who think they're unsuccessful. It's a five, it's a five uh, ID scale. And so, Yeah. 
So there's also a neutral answer. But it, it, it is the case that not, but no, no, it is the case that not many people felt that they were unsuccessful or very unsuccessful at cutting projects in flight. Um, or characterize themselves that way. This is, this is the other question, which will, which will come up again in a moment. Um, and finally, importance. Uh, right? This is the stuff that people thought was unimportant or very unimportant. Create a repository of ideas and review them periodically. Uh, presumably high covalence with, with the previous slide. Making decisions about cutting projects in flight. So I think this may have something to do with your question. Um, Again, a high degree of unimportance. And finally, attract other incubation teams and team members to work on incubation within your charter. Right. So again, crossing the social line. Uh, there is uh, right, the top six important, just to, since we've gone through six slides. Right. These are the top six things registered as important by, by self-reporting. Now again, I don't, I don't work at Microsoft. I don't know whether those are the right answers from the point of view of corporate strategy, but that is the self-characterization on this test. Right. Ideas are easy. Right. That, is, that, is un, un, uh, that is important, easy, successful. I think we can regard idea generation as, as something that, that is going well. The rest are either more than half the group characterize them as difficult or less than half the group characterize them as easy um, for those other five categories. Uh, there is some correlation between things that are hard, things that are unsuccessful, th things at which we are unsuccessful, and things that are unimportant. Uh, there's a couple of possible answers for that. Uh, one is there's just a certain amount of paperwork that goes with any job. And this may all be the stuff that you kind of have to get through. Uh, on the other hand, there's also an enormous psychological temptation to say stuff that I don't do well or stuff that I find hard is also stuff that's unimportant. Um, that category, I think, has to be, has to be looked at within, uh, within the context of what the goals are. Uh, and the thing that jumped out at me was the high salience of any question that involved working outside the membrane, right? Getting the, getting the attention of thought leaders, finding groups outside of my group who might want to work on something, exporting things from my group into the product group, working on multi-product strategy. Um, which suggests to me that at least one theme here is what's the appropriate degree of permeability of a membrane? And when is a get versus a put operation for ideas? When do you want senior management to come by and look in to get ideas, your fellow researchers to look in and get ideas? And when do you want to put ideas out there? Uh, when do you want to characterize them early on? So before I go on to, before I go on to patterns, uh, questions or conversation about this? Sir. Yes, yes. Our whole model for doing this uh, is, could, could, be, could be dramatically improved if we, if we start to bring in a lot more of the social networking stuff. And so the, the, the idea of getting, for example, getting uh, senior leaders interested, you know, if you look at uh, what happened with the bank and, and with students, and, right. and you look at how, right. how uh, a particular
Test one, two. Presumably you can still hear me. You could simultaneously be in Friendster and not see lots of other people. So there were, there were barriers, but they were different for every single user. A very different pattern than either bulletin boards or mailing lists. And because of that, social networks act as both filters and amplifiers. And I think the thing you just said about these ideas bubble up, the places where they bubble up are places where it isn't one person saying something to you. It's four or five people saying similar things that join together. Right? There's been a lot of study of gossip networks. And the interesting thing about gossip is you know the gossip that's relevant to you, and you don't know the gossip that's not relevant to you. Right? How does that happen? It happens because you rely on all of your friends to either amplify or filter based on their judgment. Right? So the most famous problem in uh, in innovation is how do you advertise your innovations? But then there becomes this premium on showmanship. I, I literally heard this phrase inside the Pentagon the other day. I heard someone compliment someone else on their slidesmanship. Right? Like that's now a word in the military industrial complex. Right? Because ideas are hard to evaluate, but slides are not. Right? Those are some good slides. I like those slides. Let's, let's give that guy some money. The, the advertising problem puts such a premium on presenting your ideas that you get this situation where people who present bad ideas well get more support than people who present good ideas badly. What social networks potentially allow is not the kind of one-on-one, -on -one, I have 12 minutes with the boss and I've got to blow through this deck so that you know, my idea gets green-lighted. And instead says, if a dozen engineers look at this, and six or seven of them say, you know, that's interesting. That, that has a one in a hundred shot of working, right? It's no longer down to that one short face-to-face -face meeting, I got to get the slides just right, I got to make the big pitch. And it filters through the network to, to the source of judgment. That, exactly right, exactly right. That's right. That's right. No, and in fact, right, uh, Facebook turns out to be, uh, for some industries, better than LinkedIn at doing exactly that and, 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 and because of these reasons. So other, other questions or observations. And let me actually, let me tee up what we'll do at lunch. Um, we want to get into breakout. We want to identify basically places where we could imagine the climate for innovation getting much better, not incrementally better, anybody can imagine that, much better, dramatically better inside Microsoft. Some of that will involve removing obstacles, some of that will involve adding capabilities, some of that will involve altering mindset. And what we want to do is surface the kinds of questions, observations, ideas, hopes, annoyances, whatever, that you all have, and then figure out which ones are most salient to you, and then get into breakout groups and discuss them, and then it, later in the afternoon report back, here are some things we could do that would lead to these kind of dramatic shifts. So before I go into this question of this, this last question of patterns, are there any other observations about the internal survey from within, from within Microsoft? Okay. So I want to I want to call out extending extending this conversation. In fact, call out some of the things that I think are changing in the innovation landscape. Some of this has been teed up by what we talked about already, but I think it's worth uh, worth focusing on a few of them. Uh, creativity is an export import export. Ron Burt, a sociologist at the University of Chicago, uh, wrote a paper uh, in the early part of this decade called "The Social Origin of Good Ideas." And he had a natural experiment handed to him, a, uh, a consumer electronics company, anonymized in the paper, but which I assume is Gateway, had all of its top management chopped off at the same time. 
a new management team came in. And so they were taking a fresh look at the business, all of them at the same time. And so what Bert did is he went around, uh, in particular to the shipping department, and he said, tell us some ideas that will make your company more profitable. And they picked the shipping department because you wouldn't ordinarily pick shipping as the beating heart of that particular business. But they touched a lot of the other business units. And then he took all of these ideas back to senior management to rank them. Uh, and then he just tried to see which individuals uh, had produced the highest percentage of good ideas. And what he found, right, so this is, this is a sociogram of the company, right? The middle is senior management, and then these are each of the various departments. The gray areas are each of the various departments. We would call them silos if we were using that language, but you can see they're all actually interconnected, as you would expect. And what Bert found is that people who were at a higher risk of having good ideas, his phrase, were people whose, whose social networks spanned domains. Right? It wasn't the engineers and it wasn't the designers. It was engineers who talked to the designers. It was designers who talked to the engineers. It was people who saw into both environments. Even when you control for removing all of senior management who are, after all, paid to be highly connected and are expected to look into the different divisions, there was a very strong correlation between the people who had the high scores, who were given high scores by management and analyzing those ideas, and people whose connections spanned the structural design of the hierarchy of the business. This is creativity as an import-export business. Uh, it is very much in the spirit of what Gary was saying this morning of chocolate and peanut butter style innovations. Very often, combination of elements beats just crawling up that component complexity, uh, just crawling up the component complexity axis by itself. And the people who have been best able to do this in, 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 in Bert's analysis uh, are people who span what he calls structural holes. Uh, structural holds is yet another, right, if we're, if we're wrestling for, for, for metaphors between silo membranes, structural holds is yet another attempt to label the same problem. But what's interesting about the language of structural holes is it specifically assumes that something is missing when two business units are disconnected, right? The other thing that is, I think, clear about the BERT analysis is not everybody can be a connector. If everybody's a connector, who's back in the lab getting anything done, right? So this isn't a question of, oh, everybody stop what you're doing and suddenly network with everybody else. Instead, it's a question of identifying those people who are at the highest risk of having good ideas, right? Um, very often, those people are not going to be much more than brokers. Oh, I was just talking to so-and-so the other day, right? I think everybody's had the experience of, a market opportunity suddenly opens up and it turns out right, that you've actually got something in the labs that's touching on that problem. And that, I think, is one of the things that, that Gary was saying this morning. Right? It's good to have a lot of $10,000 ideas lying around as well as the billion dollar ones. Because at some point, right, that just increases the possibility that when an opportunity arises between domains, uh, you can take advantage. Second big change uh, is a radically altered uh, possibility in terms of defining the nature of work. This is, this is my favorite dramatization of this change right now. Uh, it's an art piece called 10,000 Cents. The artist took a $100 bill, scanned it at high resolution, uh, then broke it up into 10,000 tiny rectangles, went on to Mechanical Turk, and said, for one penny, I will pay you to copy this rectangle. So. Here's, here's a piece of a scan. It's that little red square there. This is a piece of a scan of a dollar bill. So when you get the hit, when you get the, the job in Mechanical Turk, all you see is this. Right? You have no idea what you're even working on. Right? And then he says, go to this web tool and copy this. Right? So somebody goes in and makes a copy. And this is, this is a screenshot in, in the middle of it. it. It was eventually all filled in sort of green and tan or whatever. And then the artist assembled all 10,000 of the little copies right, into this facsimile of a $10,000 bill, which you can buy for $100. So it was a $100 bill. right? It cost 10,000 cents, $100 worth of pennies, to do the job. 
The 10,000 pieces were reassembled, and the facsimile of a $100 bill is sold as a poster for $100. Right? When we think about work, right, particularly in the US context, the question is, oh, I got some new stuff to do. Is it 2,000 hours worth of new stuff, so I got to hire somebody? Is it 1,000 hours so I can get a part-timer to do it? Is it 100 hours so maybe I can sort of syndicate it around with my staff? Right? These are enormous calculations. Right? This thing was assembled calculating not with years and hours, but with minutes and seconds. Right? The, the task was broken down into elements so far beneath the threshold of what we regard as work that it's a different way of taking on a task. And the really interesting thing to me, right, was the chart of who came by and what they did when they were there, right? In the U.S., the average visitor came by for, for a little bit over two and a half minutes. Uh, and f about five out of six users came by once and only once. Looky lose, right? They just wanted to come see what was going on. Holland, the effect is even more dramatic, right? A great love of, of Internet art, but they only came by for a minute and change. And everybody who came by came by once and only once. Oh, look, it's a U.S. $100 bill. How quaint, say the holders of euros. India, average time on site 11 minutes, three quarters, three quarters of the users uh, are one time only. But 11 minutes means that one quarter of the users were actually doing this like a job. China, 90% of the people who came came more than once. Average time on site 23 minutes. Egypt. 97% of the people copying this $100 bill did more than one of those, those rectangles. Average time on site, right? So where did it? Average time on site over half an hour. So this syndication of labor, right? It's just, it's a change in the landscape and it's a change in the way we think about work. What makes Wikipedia Wikipedia is that the smallest unit of labor is so vastly beneath anything we would regard as a job or even really a task. Right? I fixed a typo on the Pluto article. Only change I've ever made to that article. I fixed a typo. Right? There is no job that says, go fix a typo. In the time that it takes to describe what article and how to log in and fix the typo, you've already spent more energy than actually fixing the typo. Right? And a lot of the change in service design, in involving of interested users and so forth, has to do with this dramatic reduction in the size of the underlying, the, the granularity of the underlying task. Final observation. Um, and this is, I think, one of the most important ones. And, and, and I, I think one of the things that Gary was talking about this morning as well. This is, this is SourceForge. Um, world's largest repository of open source projects. You can see here, right, uh, over 10,000 games, a few thousand things for desktops, 20,000 things for development, and so on, right? 160,000 or so projects at the time I did this, uh, time I did this analysis. And when you look at, right, the most downloaded projects on the site, like Game, which is a, 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 an instant messaging, instant messaging client, the most active, 100th percentile of activity, most active project on the site. You see, right, it was getting, at the time I did this, it was getting 10,000 downloads a day, right? So this is the hype that's been around uh, open source, right, as these, these projects come along, uh, they're self-assembled, they become very popular, millions of people get them, right? And, and some of these projects have gotten millions or 10 millions of, of, of lifetime downloads. You can see, though, that the percentile of activity right, descends. And when you scrape the surface even a little bit, right? so now we're down at the 99.5th percentile, still one of the most active projects on SourceForge. It's not 10,000 downloads a day, or 1,000, or even 100. It's half that. Right? There is just an epsilon away from the most active projects, there is a precipitous decline in the success of these projects. Right? Dozens of downloads a day instead of tens of thousands. Right? When you get down to the 75th percentile in SourceForge, you see the first project that has one developer, no downloads, ever. 
total abject failure on any possible scale on which you can analyze software. And that is three quarters of the project on SourceForge. If you do a little snapshot, you can see, right, this is uh, just, just the top 1,000 projects, activity by rank, there's game, and then here's shutdown monster, right, at the 99th, 5th percentile. Same, same parallel distribution as Wikipedia. It's the common signature of large-scale efforts. This line, right, this is 1,000 of them. It goes 160,000. It would probably go through the lobby, right, of just one developer, no downloads, So was the press gotten it wrong about open source, right? Are they over-focused on Linux and Apache uh, as, the, uh, as the poster children when, in fact, right, the normal case is failure? And the answer there is yes, demonstrably, measurably yes. Uh, then the second question is, is open source, in fact, not a, uh, a game-changing uh, alteration to the environment? And the answer there is no. It is, it is a big deal. It's a big deal not because it's out-succeeding commercial efforts, but because it's out failing them. Right. The, the effect of failure on an institution is likelihood times cost. Right. And almost every institution is set up to lower the likelihood of failure. Right. How do we help this project succeed? Because in open source, the, the risk is borne by the initial proposer. The risk is dramatically syndicated across the entire group of participants. Right? What's going on here is that the cost of failure has been lowered, and people are failing like crazy. Right? And that, I think, is the, is the flip side of this change in both scale, the, the increase in scale and the reduction in size, is it makes the cost of failing very, very low. Um, and I want to I end with this emphasis uh, you, you, that, that Gary also talked about this morning, the strategy tax. Right? Every one of us in this room has sat in a meeting where you've said, we are spending more energy talking about whether or not X is a good idea than, just, than it would cost us to just try X and see if it happened. Right? And that tax... right? makes sense if you're trying to preserve a mature market because you have customers who have high costs of adoption and switching and so forth. But in an innovative market, as, 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 as Gary showed, when, when, when you flip to a, an innovation landscape, just trying things, lowering the cost to the point where you can just try things and see what works, uh, is a really radical alternate way to explore a very much larger landscape uh, than if you have to try to decide in advance whether something is a good idea. I teach um, at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at, at, at NYU, and I've, um, I'm entering my eighth year there. And uh, the age of my students, average age of my students has stayed the same. My average age has grown at the alarming rate of one year per year. And I'm now in the unhappy position of teaching my own uh, youth as ancient history. For my students, the web was built out. It was urban scale when they got there. And so I have to spend some time trying to explain to them what a crazy series of accidents some of it was. And one of the slides I put up is Larry Sanger's first message to the new PDA mailing list. Right? And it says, in full, right, we're going to try this thing called a wiki. Just go there. Do me a favor. Just go there and create a little article. It'll take you all of five or ten minutes. If you had been given access to every email message sent on that day in 2001, there is absolutely no way that anyone would have picked out that message as a world-changing one. Right? Sanger didn't have to do a bunch of slide presentations to try to get somebody to give him the right to da, da, da. Look, we're just trying it. Do me a favor. Go there. It'll take all the five or ten minutes. Right? And that, that change, trying lots of things at low cost, syndicating to the groups that are willing to give you feedback, and letting the successes ramify, um, however that's taken advantage of inside these four walls, 
is I think one of the really big changes going on uh, in, in the larger environment. So with that, I'll end. Um, and I think try and surface some reactions or sense, sense from people of, and if you could pick one or two things to change here that you thought would lead to a, a, a large change in the success of innovation efforts, not just an incremental improvement, right? More comfortable chairs, whatever. A large change. What, what would it be? I mean, the thing I'm, I, again, from the outside, the thing I was struck by is the number of places where stuff that crosses the membrane, right, getting, getting the attention of thought leaders, finding other incubation groups, like, that was the stuff that fell down into the uh, difficult, unsuccessful category. And I'm, I'm wondering, are there places where an increasingly porous membrane in fairly strategic ways, not just, you know, complete openness, dump everything out, but... Increased cross communication can do it. Yes. Another very interesting uh, aspect of this chart, which is that the cost of extreme success is also extremely low. <laughs> yes, that's right. Right. Um, yes. Right. If 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 you if you can activate a network, right, uh, to to work on right. a problem, right, then you're not talking necessarily about having to invest huge amounts of money yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I work in the Internet Explorer team at the moment, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at Mozilla and what it does with Mozilla, for example, yep. and the, the whole yep. database and, right. and right. How, how they've recruited this pool of people who just fix bugs, yep. find bugs and yep. fix them. Yep. And uh, that, kind of, uh, that, that kind of occupies a fair amount of time yes. in the Internet Explorer. Yes. Um, yes. In any, I mean, in any company. Yeah. Like yeah. But, but the, the idea that if you get this right, Right. The cost of extreme success is also right. extremely right. low. Right. Gary, Gary didn't say this, but my sense from his talk was that ultimately being pushed to launch Photosynth on their own with a small budget was beneficial to the project because if they'd gone into a full phase of get it, get it combat ready before we allow user one in. Um, People were already talking about Photosynth, and I think they would have lost some of the momentum. I think probably launching, even with a database that breaks for six hours, even launching when they're ready to launch because they can tolerate the failure rather than because they have to bulletproof against the failure was, was, was probably beneficial. Um, yes, sir? No, I'm sure. And in fact, one of the, one of the things that characterizes this, this is very high visibility. A fairly common pattern is three or four people will go in and say, I want to do a JavaScript library for dynamic image handling. And then it becomes clear which of them is getting momentum. Uh, there's a great story from, um, from O'Reilly Publishing where they were watching Usenet, right? They, and now they've, they've set this up as O'Reilly Radar as a fairly formal thing. But they were watching Usenet and just doing sort of significant, you know, significant phrase analysis. And their problem, of course, is they're firing a long way from a moving target, right? And so they'd commissioned a book on, on MSQL, the, uh, the database. And O'Reilly then went to the MSQL authors and said, you know what, MSQL traffic is declining, but this MySQL thing, that traffic is going up. Why don't you rewrite the book? And so they published both sets of examples side by side. And they had the first book. In, in fact, because they'd started production on a different book, they were able to graft some of the social observations of this network. And that visibility um, is, again, it's not a project-based thing. It's an ecosystem-based thing. And this is, I mean, this is, I mean, w with, with, with the admitted caveat that this is my bias, I wonder if the, the getting the attention of thought leaders problem isn't the problem it is because it's at the end of the conveyor belt. 
And if there were ways in which people inside the company had lighter weight awareness of more of what was going on, not demo day, half an hour FaceTime, but just a kind of, you know, whatever the equivalent would be, an atom feed inside the company of here are some interesting ideas that are circulating. And so it was exposure to an idea in a lightweight way across three or four touch points rather than a big high stakes presentation at the end. Um, whether or not that might actually integrate the the innovation groups with the you know with with the managerial imperatives managerial imperatives elsewhere. But let I me mean, let me ask the question more directly. And I know it's I know it's lunchtime and I'm standing between you and lunch, which which I don't like to do. But um, if you could change one thing, what would you change? Mm. Interesting. Right. 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 Uh, yeah. One of the one of the things I often I I, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and, and one of the things I often say to, to, to business is trying to, you know, wrestle with, with socializing certain problems inside the enterprise is if you've got somebody who's got the million-dollar idea, send them out for some fresh air and lock the door behind them. Don't let them back until they come back with either $10,000 ideas or $110,000 ideas. Because once you say we have a single million-dollar idea, everybody's got a premium on saying it went well, Right. And the, 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 the skull on the pike staff of that is the, the wikitorial. Do you remember this thing? The LA Times announced that they were getting all wiki in 2006. And they took all their editorial pages and launched it in a wiki. Uh, and it was a catastrophe. It lasted less than 48 hours. It was filled with, with flame wars and, and spam and porn and goat say images. And it was, just, it was a nightmare. Um, what they'd done is they borrowed credit from the future, where most credit <laughs> exists. And they'd released a press release in advance about how great it was going to be. And that very fact doomed the project. If they just shut up about it and said, oh, we tried this thing, and it went OK, but it wasn't great, but here's what we learned. And they didn't tell anybody about it until after they'd done it. Right? But because they, they, they were in this high stakes game of trying to look all webified relative to other newspapers, they actually ended up killing their own project, and I think that's that's. I think there are lots of places where the expectation environment is is uh, is a big part of this. Um, my, the hair stood up on the back of my neck when Gary said, "Oh, now that we've shipped Photosynth, other people take us really seriously." And I thought, "Oh, that will come back to bite you, right?" Because, right? The, I mean, the whole, his whole talk was, "We do a lot of stuff that doesn't work," and. If the idea is, oh, those people hit photosynth like things out of the park every single time they come by our office, uh, you know, that's, that, I mean, it's, it's exactly that expectation stuff. Yeah, Chris? Actually, I just think that's really the sense that you're talking about, which is most product teams are expected to nail it every time. And then you see mm -hmm. like Most people, most people are very much incentivized to ship 
consistently, okay, if, it, it's, if you fail a few times, you're out of there in, in the product groups, as you, you know, everybody knows that. So I, I think, you know, the incentives there, are, I don't see very many positive incentives for people to do this type of collaboration, you know, across their silos. Right. right. So you're trying to break that, right? We're, yeah, we're trying to break that, yeah. the culture, the, the cultural overhang. The other problem that's related to this is if you fail nine times, it, it's not a guarantee the tenth one is going to succeed because you're going right, to you know, yeah. succeed one oh, time I, in yeah, ten. It just came up heads nine times over. It's definitely yeah, fails this time. Yeah, yeah. You know, nine times out of ten, you're like, okay. And, and then if you do get your one hit, you still don't know, you know statistically, is that one in a hundred or what's your actual rate going to be? Right. And so people start to lose their nerve after you know, 19 failures or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly what the answer to that is. It's maybe an incentivization thing. It's, it's certainly the challenge we have as we grow. A lot of our teams are new. People are coming from their entire school history and then their careers are all about trying and succeeding. No one wants to be a quitter. No one wants to fail. You know, they all expect to be rewarded for succeeding. And trying to turn that all on its head even in a, a year or two is, is hard. And school is also so much quality control of individual minds. That the rhetoric of school is, you know, we fill your brain with these facts, slap a diploma on you, and send you out. And suddenly to be in a collaborative environment, which um, different different than a managed work team. Yeah. Lily, were you? Well, I mean, to continue on failure, um, I just thought it was interesting in the survey. I mean, the, the failure point was probably something to add to your slide when you asked if people had other things to add to the slide, because I thought it was a low priority, but people thought they did a pretty good job at, at failing. And it's probably one of the significant differences from open source from, you know, the learnings. So I just think it'd be good right. to maybe add that to your list. Very good. Yes, ma'am. So uh, if I could change something, it would be a facility to us to, like you said, laterally discover each other and do it out of our own self-interest and do it in a way which is not completely reliant on our individual relationships, which are very beneficial, but it doesn't provide us with the ability to connect at scale or speed across the company to take on an opportunity or solve a problem. Okay. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think there's, um, going back to a question, if there's one thing you would change, I think in this space we're dealing with two major aspects. One is uh, business aspect. It's all the stuff that people have been mentioning, right set of incentives, right, uh, right models for trying and failing and succeeding, all of this. And there is also technology aspect, because all, all we see happening in spaces like Wikipedia and open source, it took the right technology to get to that level. And within the company right now, we have certain things, but we don't have the right infrastructure yet. And some people would know why I'm saying this, because. Uh -huh. That's the projects I've been working on, but I think that's a major investment right. in addition to business. They should be together, but there are at least two major things that should be happening to move this forward. And things that people have been mentioning, including you, this lateral discovery and uh, broad-scale collaboration and internal crowdsourcing, it requires the right uh, corporate-wise technologies um, available mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. to everyone. Yeah. How, how easy is it to not use SharePoint? I mean, you can if you if you if you if you said okay, right? That, that, I, I'm I'm trying to coming from outside the company. I'm trying to read into what what how this. Right. Okay. The environment you don't have to use specifically that technology. Got it. Okay. Okay. One more question here. Uh, mine's more That's kind of a more comment. Of it. It's um, I'm curious about. Like we talk about that innovation sometimes depends on like the thought leaders or these visionary people. I mean, it's trying to get the balance between do you organize around visionary people or do you actually try and build an organization that trains and can coach people how to be innovative? Like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, how do you actually? Because I noticed when I was reading there was an article about Pixar re recently where you know, they organize around film directors. So they're really actually organizing around visionary thought leaders, just very senior, prominent people. Right. Versus how do you actually build an organization that, you know, coaches and nurtures innovation and grows people who are actually more junior to be thought leaders? And maybe you can't do the latter, and maybe it is only around visionary thought leaders. It's more an observation. Almost by definition, you know, anything leader, ex-leader, assumes that there's a small group of people who are having these kinds of 
functions, whether it's, it's discovering things or just, just even broadcasting what's good. But there, there are examples of cultural adoption of, of, of innovation, as with Toyota's Pokeyoke uh, sort of design, foolproofing the industrial design so that you can't put the car together wrong. And, and famously, Toyota syndicated the problem of, of continuous improvement to its own work staff. And everybody saw it happening. Everybody knew how it was happening. Right? HBR did about a bazillion articles on it. There were a shelf full of books. Right? Ford could not do that to save their lives because it, wa it was exactly the latter camp, which is it required a cultural shift which said, Right, the, the, the line of business employees, right, the guys standing on the assembly line um, are also the best guys to figure out, you know, if we made this a rectangle instead of a square, we couldn't turn it the wrong direction, and then we would always bolt it on right. So there are, there are places where you can get continuous process improvement by involving, um, by involving people. So I'll put that down as visionaries and versus culture. Is that a... Yes, that is true. Um, yes, that's an interesting point about structuring the organization around thought leaders. Um, but there's a famous qu quote that kind of sticks in my mind when Hunter Thompson was interviewing Sonny Barger, the leader of the San Francisco <laughs> Hells Angels. And he said, how do you recruit new members? And Sonny Barger said, we don't recruit them, we recognize them. Right. They're already outlaws. Yeah. They're already out there. Yeah. And the whole point about kind of a social networking thing is it allows thought leadership to emerge yeah. without, without putting a yeah. formal structure and saying these people are thought leaders, therefore they are the people who are going to drive all of this, and we've got this kind of a formal structure. The most inter another interesting site on there was the incentive one, yeah. where I looked at that and I thought, you know, if we had a site like that inside Microsoft, you know, we've got... We've got 90,000 smart people, most of whom don't ever get to talk to one another or, figure, or, or, or even see what the problems are. Right. And if we could surface some of that uh, and make that happen, and then thought leaders emerge from that. You know, this is, this is like a social networking innovation uh, system, but, but not, not, in a, not in a formally structured way. Let it emerge. The, wait, I'm sorry, within, within Microsoft? Within Microsoft. Oh, okay. The, the idea exchange, if, if I understand right, is trying to be that. You can issue a challenge. You can, people can bubble up ideas. Oh, so uh, I want to throw out just a thought on, the or, on, on as an, a, a different thought. You know, there's the organize around thought leaders and what do we reward, and there's a lot of rewarding of the individual brilliance. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder when I look at the, the BERT study, if uh, we take too much for granted the connectors and, oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. and don't uh, value enough the ability for people to see the valuable connections and make them happen. Uh, a good example. I did nothing. I, I really did nothing on clear type whatsoever. I connected Bert Keeley with Greg Hitchcock and Mike Duggan and, and saw the synergy. And, and that's kind of how that came about. I, as, I, as I often say, I'm, I was the hood ornament in that project. On the other hand, if I hadn't made the connection, it would never have happened. Right. Um, you know, so... Look, Jerry, Jerry McCalsey, who, who has famously characterized himself as a bumblebee, um, makes exactly that point, right? That the connectors are... Um, the, the connectors are people with very high salience for a very short period of time, right? In, in personal life, it's Yentas. In business life, it's, right, here's an investor and here's a, you know, here's a person who's, who's, who's got a business. It's, it's those kind of brokers. And one of the things that this kind of analysis breaks you of is the notion that you're looking at a relatively self-similar group of people, right? The, the difference in behavior between... Brian Vibber, and, and, and Brian's one and only one contribution, and Serendipitous, who parks on Wikipedia and watches it like a hawk. Those people are doing different things, right? 
One of the things that has not yet happened much, it's, happened in, it, 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 it's happening some now in Wikipedia, is the idea of designing a tool set for these people that's different than the tool set for those people. On Wikipedia right now, it's mainly around the defensive stuff, right? about defending articles from vandalism. But uh, one of the things that Jerry has often said is, given the business value that connectors generate, why is it that no one is making tools for people who are doing very high-volume, short-term interventions? And there may be something to designing tools around connectors, around surfacing these ideas. I think we've got enough to spark a conversation, so let me let me say, let's get lunch um, before we all fall over, and we'll put some stuff up on the boards, and then try and uh, try and draw a little bit more of this out and, 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 and sync up. I think lunch is in the, yeah, yep. in, in the other room.